Perhaps you've heard the old quote, a lie can travel around the world while truth is putting on his boots. Well, yes. I wonder why that is. Oh, I, I imagine the Bible has something to say about that, don't you? Stay with us and let's see. In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, it does my heart good to have you join our Bible study in search of the Lord's way to become a Christian and to live the Christian life. His is really the only way to be saved and become a Christian, and it's the best way to live that man has ever discovered or invented. We pray we'll both be blessed by our study together today. We're here through the love and generosity of some of our friends, yours and mine, who are members of Churches of Christ in the area. Perhaps some of them live next door to you or across the street, or, or maybe they're your grocerman or school teacher or medical doctor, or you may be theirs, whatever. They'd surely love to have you worship with them in the church nearby. If you need help in learning more about the Church of Christ near you, when or where they meet or something else about them, let us be that help, will you? We do it for people every day. Simply write us, In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Or by email, the address is searchtv at aol.com. And if you like just to call us, please use our toll-free telephone number, 1-800-321-8633. Our study today is about truth. What is truth, anyway? Does anybody really know we're being taught, even in religious circles these days, that there is no such thing as truth. We can't know anything. The only thing we can be sure about is that we can't be sure about anything. <laughs> We're not the first to ask about it, though. Remember, old Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And philosophers and theologians and sages, oh, and lots of others, are still asking it. There's still more about truth that we need to know. And one thing we need to know is love of the truth. That's what we're, our message is about today. Ken Heltbrand's going to lead us now as we sing, and then we'll be back for that study. The suggestion for our sermon today is from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. The Apostle Paul is talking about the coming of the Lord, and he says, Let no one deceive you by any means that that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And I read through verse 10. Now let's go to God in prayer. 
Holy Father, we are so thankful for the revelation of your word because we believe that your word is truth. Even as Jesus said in his prayer, we believe that, Father, and we pray your, meditation, your blessings upon us in our meditations today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It isn't my purpose today to study through all the false teachings that are prophesied in the verses that we read a while ago from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. It's sufficient for the time anyway just to notice that those teachings are number one, false, and number two, they're said to be so by God himself. I mean, in a society that denies the existence of truth, it's unacceptable for any one person to say anything negative about another person's doctrine, even if it's known to be false and even damnable. So we'll just point out the obvious. God said it himself, and it shall be my intent to do otherwise. My purpose today is to increase our love of the truth that we might be saved. Early in the 1990s, two men, James Patterson, a man who had distinguished himself in advertising, and Peter Kim, nationally known in research, co-authored a book which they titled The Day America Told the Truth. They were thorough in their research, and, and they learned that um, in America, just about everyone lies. They said 91% of us lie regularly, age 45. Such a languid attitude uh, toward truth is a leading cause of the erosion of our American morality. And in religious circles, it's resulted in a lack of conviction and commitment that's robbed faith of its meaning and destroyed public confidence in religion. As a matter of fact, the only way to justify the confusion of modern American religion is to take truth very lightly. The Word of God is true, my friend. And Jesus said that thy word is truth. And so it's true on anything 
to which it speaks. And whatever it says is always relevant. Well, King Solomon, the wisest mere man who's ever lived on the earth, said in his book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. Well, the idea is to consider truth as a thing of highest value and spare no pains or cost or sacrifice to obtain it. it, is to be valued as a great treasure. And when we've secured it, we're admonished to keep it safely, not to trade it or exchange it for profit or for pleasure, not to be reasoned out of it or laughed out of it. Sell it not means simply not to part with it under any circumstances. Well, from this passage then, Truth seems to be a commodity of great worth, a treasure that's within the reach of all of us. Back to old Pilate's question, what is truth? When the Savior was brought before him, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause was I born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. That's John chapter 18, verses 36 through 38. Jesus had told him the way it was. Pilate recognized it for the way that it really was and reported to the Jews he had found no fault in Jesus. Really, truth is hard to define, but, but Pilate knew how to do it. I think the best definition I've ever seen of it is uh, that one that was given by Samuel Thompson and a book called A Modern Philosophy of Religion. He said, a judgment is true if what we judge something to be is what the thing is. Well then, a person is told the truth if what he says a thing is is what it is. A proposition is true if what it states is what the thing is. A doctrine is true if what it says is what it really and actually is. The Scripture says you buy that and you don't part with it uh, for any price. Can we know the truth? Of course we can. Or the passage we're studying is an absurdity. In Jesus' statement in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. All of that is totally without meaning if it's impossible to know the truth. Furthermore, God plainly declares that it is His will that we all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. My, how we ought to love the truth. It was interesting to me that um, in a paper titled Ways of Justifying Belief, Charles Sanders Peirce, American philosopher of about a century ago, began by arguing that faith or truth cannot be found in tenacity. We usually think of tenacity as synonymous with courage, meaning the capacity to maintain or to adhere to something considered of great value and hold on to it all the way through. And that's a virtue. And that's what we're saying about loving the truth. But there is a way in which it isn't a virtue. Percy illustrated what he meant by saying that once he was uh, entreated not to read a certain newspaper, lest it change his opinion on free trade, well, this kind of tenacity is what we think of as prejudice. And it's like the fellow who says, I already know what I believe, so don't confuse me with the truth. It's a closed mind. There may be a sense of security in it as the fellow who remains cool, calm, and collected in full view of an approaching tornado because he's been told and he believes the old Indian proverb that a tornado will never cross a river and to disturb him, it would have to cross the river. It's a false 
sense of security. Prejudice may be comfortable, but it's a poor way to justify what one believes. Such a person will probably never arrive at the truth. Truth will bear investigation, my friend. Ignoring truth won't change it. Truth isn't found in traditionalism either. Again, tradition isn't a bad word. The primary dictionary, of defin uh, dictionary definition of tradition is the handing down of information, beliefs, and customs by word of mouth or by example from one generation to another without written instructions. And that's what um, all Christian parents are committed to and what they want to do for their children. Paul rejoiced in Timothy's unfeigned faith which dwelt first in his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And the Apostle Paul admonished Christians at Thessalonica to stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. But this too can be carried too far. There were those in those days of our Lord who'd actually transgressed the commandments of God by keeping their traditions. Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus said they'd made the commandment of God of no effect. They'd actually rendered God's commandments void by adhering strictly to their traditions. Verse 6, and in verse 9, he said their worship was vain, meaning that it was empty, worthless, and hollow, because they taught for their doctrines the commandments of men. It isn't too radical to say the same thing occurs today when men seek for truth, the final word, and what their foreparents believed and taught. They may have taught the truth, but it isn't truth simply because they taught it. We must remember that Nothing is true just because we or our family always believed it. We must know, too, that truth isn't to be found in conventionalism. I mean, in the majority opinion. We don't arrive at truth by taking a poll. Everybody may be doing it, admittedly so, and it still be wrong. In a democratic society such as ours, we're accustomed to accepting the majority vote. That becomes the law of the land, and we all abide by it. But it isn't necessarily in accord with the way it is in God's Word. It's an expression of what shall be, but it isn't necessarily what actually is, you see. If we can put any confidence in what Jesus taught, and personally I can, the great masses of people will be in the broad way that leads to destruction while the small minority will enter the straight gate into the narrow way to eternal life. That's his teaching in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, 14. Often religionists point with pride to the large church and say, surely so many people can't be wrong. Well, God doesn't take opinion polls before he speaks or acts. Truth doesn't need the approval of the crowd or the applause of men. And... We need not expect to find truth in institutionalism. Oh, I know I won't go to hell, a woman said, because our church doesn't believe in hell. Well, she may be in for a shocking surprise. Still, some people shop around to find a church that teaches like they've always believed and uh, so they can be comfortable in it. Obviously, such a person isn't looking for truth. He doesn't have that love for the truth that's so necessary. He's looking for comfort. There are more than 3,000 different denominations in America today, and they're proliferating at the rate of about one a day just to satisfy this attitude. Many of these are one congregation denominations built by preachers and others who, who hold truth very lightly, who want to believe what they want to believe, who want to do what they want to do, who want to teach what they want to teach, and all of that. It's amazing that these blind guides can always find a blind following. 
the loving Savior himself said to these people, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Matthew 7, verse 15. Be assured, my friend, that truth is not found in emotionalism. A good feeling, the thrill of a religious experience. The scriptures say the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. And Proverbs 14, 12 tells us too, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. A teaching of faith is not truth simply because it makes you feel good about it. Surely believing and loving the truth is comforting and stimulating and strengthening and inspiring and more than that. But just think of the times when you were led to believe something and you felt great about it and you called your friends and, and they rejoiced with you about it and your family was excited and glad and then you learned it wasn't that way at all. I think of the old patriarch Jacob when I think of this. His other sons took his favorite son and sold him into bondage to, and to cover up their evil deed, they, they took Joseph's coat and dipped it in the blood of an animal and brought it to Jacob and asked him if he knew whether this was Joseph's coat. Well, of course, he recognized it as the gift that he'd given to his son. Genesis 37, uh, verses 29 through 36 says, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast, a, a, a wild beast has, has devoured him. And without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. You and I know that Joseph wasn't dead at all. The other boys had told a lie, and Jacob believed that lie, and he grieved just as much over it as if it had been the truth. And there's another thing about that. He believed that falsehood so strongly that later, Genesis 45, 26, when those sons came back home from Egypt and told their father that Joseph was alive and well and was governor over all the land of Egypt, Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. The point is that by relying on one's feelings often repents, uh, prevents one from believing the truth when it's presented to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the revelation of your truth, beautiful, precious truth in your word. Help us, Father, as we strive to love it more and to do it with faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Love of the truth is an absolute essential in finding it. If we don't find truth in religion of our foreparents or in what our church teaches or in the generally accepted point of view or in a religious experience, how can we know the truth of the gospel? 
My friend, Jesus Christ is the very embodiment of truth. The Bible says of him that he is full of grace and truth, John 1, 14, and that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, verse 17. Christ himself claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, John 14 and 6. And the Holy Spirit says that the truth is in Jesus, Ephesians 4, 21. Jesus Christ, then, is the very incarnation of religious truth. He doesn't admit of, the, of being any other truth apart from him. Some people reject Christianity for this very reason. To them, it's too exclusive. But there's something about all the world's religions that's just as exclusive as is Jesus. Then the person who accepts Jesus must have received the truth, right? It all depends on what you mean by accepting Jesus. If you mean just simply saying, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, I now accept you as Savior and Lord, the answer is no. But if you mean that you accept his teaching as truth on all subjects, and the way for your life, well, if you mean you will lovingly and obediently follow his teachings, so that in reality and truth he is Lord and Master of your life, then the answer is yes. But he once asked, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46. It's impossible to know Christ or the truth apart from the Word of God. When Paul the Apostle was driven by persecution from Thessalonica, he went to Berea and preached. Acts 17, verses 1 to 15. And the Scripture says those Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were true. The Scriptures were the basis on which they would determine truth. The Bible is referred to as the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, and it's also said to be the Word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. God's Word is truth. It's always true. It isn't to be taken lightly. It's the final word in religion. Well, if you'd like a free printed copy or an audio cassette tape of today's message, The Love of Truth, simply address your request to In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083, or by email at searchtv at aol.com, and uh, we'll get it in the mail to you as quickly as possible. If you prefer, you may use our toll-free telephone number and call in your request. And the number is 1-800-321-8633. Well, it's been good to have you with us today. I appreciate your being with us, and I pray that both of us have been blessed by our study. God bless you now. We love you.